Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Sean from Flight Grit, and I want to welcome you to this week's episode of Flight Grit Friday, where we're going to be talking about safety. So this is the third topic in the category of aircraft fundamentals, safety, and survival. We've already covered survival, aircraft fundamentals, and now we're going to be getting into the safety aspect of this category. Um, just to let you know that we're kind of changing the format a little bit and uh, we're going to be kind of trying to break these down and shorten them into about 30 minutes just to make it a little bit easier for you to consume and uh, kind of keep your attention. So I hope you enjoy it. Let me know if you uh, if you don't and uh, I'll change things up. Um, great. So before we get started, I just want to let you know that um, this category, I think uh, I said it once before, it's one of the largest categories in the uh, FPC exam as far as number of questions go. I think there's about 14 questions out of 120 that uh, apply to this category alone. Um, the aircraft fundamental safety and survival, um, all three of those topics. Uh, of those three topics, this one right now, safety is by far the largest topic uh, in the category. Um, and the theme of safety is going to continue throughout the entire test, not just in these safety specific questions. Um, so it's important to understand what I'm talking about and be able to apply these concepts to other test questions. Okay, so we're going to get right into it and uh, here we go. So uh, I've gone through the outline for the FPC exam and, and specifically this section and um, pulled out the the topics within uh, uh, within safety that are uh, most important and that I've seen and that I've heard people mention on uh, that they've seen on the exam and in reality just about every single topic comes up on a fairly regular basis so there's a lot of material here and that's that's another reason why this is most likely going to go uh, into two episodes um, but we'll just see how it goes all right so we're going to launch right into this um, the first topic on the outline and one that I get a lot of questions about and I've gotten a lot of questions over the last couple weeks when I've been hitting on this this uh, subject, uh, all of this category altogether, is scene safety. And scene safety is primarily how we keep the aircraft and keep ourselves safe on the scene of an accident or um, yeah, on the, on the side of the highway where we're going to pick up patients. So. Um, it starts with the LZ and the, uh, and the landing zone and how that is prepared. Generally speaking, we're going to want a landing zone that's 100 feet by 100 feet. So landing zone selection is generally going to happen uh, prior to us being, or prior to us getting on scene. And it's the, uh, the fire department or the ambulance service that's uh, call us that's going to be setting up the LZ. So these criteria we can try to convey to our, our our fellow EMS uh, personnel ahead of time, uh, but once we get there, we need to make sure as we're doing our evaluation before we land that the scene, that the landing zone is suitable. Okay, so um, generally speaking, what we do is we look for a landing zone that is a minimum of 100 feet by 100 feet. Um, let me come over here, um, kind of show this. 100 feet by 100 feet, and it, we need it to be fairly level. Okay, so I, I have the four L's of a landing zone, and that is it's level, it's large, 100 feet by 100 feet, it's well lit, and it's litter free. I mean, litter free uh, encompasses a number of things, um, not just paper and so on and so forth, which uh, is extremely important to, to be clear. Um, we call that FOD or foreign objects and debris, and uh, they can cause a lot of uh, problems with the aircraft um, if they get. If there's a lot of uh, fog or debris on the, the landing zone, it can get uh, pulled up into the rotor wash and it can get up into the main rotor system, into the tail rotor, it can get sucked up into our air intake, uh, and that causes, uh, that can be catastrophic for the helicopter. So those are things that we look for when we are approaching a landing zone. Is, is, it, uh, is it large, is it level, is it well lit? Uh, at night, of course. And then, um, you know, is it clear of, of, of hazards? Some other things that we need to think about when we go into a landing zone as far as hazards go are, um, are poles, um, fence posts, uh, power lines, fences, uh, 
wild or domestic animals, vehicles, um, people wandering around that uh, you know, could potentially um, get in the way of the aircraft. So these are all things that are extremely important that we need to be aware of when we're going into an LZ. control, then uh, by all means we can call them on the radio and say, hey, I need you to move this vehicle back, it's too close. Um, we always will talk to them and we'll get a, an update, um, or we'll get a description of the landing zone so that we know, uh, it, it, we have at least a general idea that it's going to be safe. We'll ask them wind direction, we'll ask them slope, we'll ask them um, surface conditions, and that at least gives us a, a general feeling of, of what the landing zone is going to be like. <clears throat> Um, I say animals, both domestic and wild, uh, that is no joke. Um, where I fly, we regularly will have um, elk and horse and cows and you name it running around in the vicinity of our landing zone. So it's very important to ensure that they're, they're not going to run into our landing zone. Uh, animals will spook and they don't just necessarily run in the opposite direction of the, of, of the big thing in the sky making a lot of noise. They oftentimes will run at it, and, and that's, that's a, a great concern for the helicopter and for the animal. So that's something that we need to be aware of. Um, as I mentioned, the landing zone needs to be well lit um, at night. Uh, one of the best ways that a uh, service can light a landing zone is by positioning vehicles at the corners of the landing zone and shining their headlights uh, into the center of the landing zone. It's very important that they are not using um, spotlights that are pointed up into the sky. Uh, it's also um, oftentimes a good idea to ask them to turn off uh, their hazards, their emergency lights, um, you know, these, these lights up here, because those can cause a lot of problems for visibility um, especially for uh, crews that are flying with night vision goggles. Uh, more and more um, helicopter crews are flying with night vision goggles, especially um, in rural areas because it improves vi visibility and it reduces the risk of going into these unimproved, non-improved uh, landing zones. Uh, you know, this may not be a pad at a hospital or at a dedicated landing zone. It may just be the middle of a field. And sometimes what you'll see is um, you'll have the corners of the landing zone marked with red lights. Sometimes you'll see um, a green, well, it would be a green light in the middle. And then um, what sometimes uh, under optimal conditions, uh, what... Uh, what you'll see is the the crew that has set up the landing zone will position a, an additional um, red light uh, in the direction that the wind is coming from, and so what you get is this this you know this these four dots with a with a fifth dot that's offset, and that fifth dot um, that fifth light is indicating the direction that the wind is coming from, and so um, generally, you know, if if you saw this under best conditions, then the, the helicopter would want to pr approach uh, in this direction so that the wind is at their nose. doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while uh, it does, and it's great. Um, I talked about debris, um, paper, cups, uh, plastics, um, signs. Um, it could be a wooden fence uh um, cross members, those can blow off, especially if they're old, and they can bounce around and they can cause hazards to the to other people, and, and potentially <clears throat> pieces can get pulled up into the rotor wash. So that's something that we want to be aware of. Also, if you're flying in a rural area uh, like I do, uh, it may not be uncommon to land in a field of sagebrush, and uh, there may be trees that have been cut down, and so what you've got is this you know, this stump sticking up, and you want to make sure that the aircraft doesn't come down on top of that stump and cause, uh, you know, cause a, a puncture at the bottom of the aircraft. That would be uh, really, really a bad situation. Um, okay, 
Um, other things to think about, um, if you're flying into a dry area, uh, there is a condition called brownout, and that is where all the dust, you see it a lot uh, in the desert, um, where the dust gets kicked up by the rotor wash, and essentially it, it reduces the visibility that the pilot has to zero because of all the dust in the air. Um, one strategy for mitigating that is to have the, if there's a fire department on scene with water, they can just spray down the landing zone with some water before you get there and that just helps keep the dust down and that's that's not only safer for the helicopter but it's also safer for everybody else on the scene. Uh, likewise if you're landing in an area uh, where there's a lot of snow, uh, snow can do the same thing. It can get kicked up especially if it's uh, a very dry light snow and that can cause a whiteout condition which can be uh, very very dangerous and uh, even potentially cause a, a crash or uh, more likely just cause the pilot to abort the landing and you have to figure out another way to uh, another landing zone. Or uh, one thing that can mitigate some of that that whiteout is to come around and to have the, the landing zone crew go around and pack down the snow in the area where the helicopter is going to be landing and that will reduce the, uh, the, the snow that gets blown up into the air. So those are a couple, uh, couple uh, strategies for trying to maximize uh, the landing zone um, conditions. Hey gang, this is Sean here popping in. Uh, there's something that I wanted to mention that I completely forgot uh, doing the initial recording, and that is um, the uh, idea of uh, how ground crew can help identify potential hazards on the scene for you before you uh, arrive so that they commu can communicate that to you. And uh, one one of the best ways that uh, I've found and that uh, um, I hear a lot of other people uh, use is this idea of um, as the LZ commander sitting at the scene, um, if they raise their hand out in front of them, arm stretched, fingers pointed, at about a 30 degree angle, and then just rotate uh, 360 degrees in all directions. What they want to do, or what they're looking for, is anything that protrudes above uh, the their fingers. So anything that they can see above their hand is a hazard. What we sometimes find are or is that uh, the commander, the person who's running the scene, doesn't identify something as being uh, hazardous and so um, uh, until we get there and then we go oh my god there's a tower right there and and what what I've found is that it's not because they're they're not paying attention is that they don't necessarily realize how far away from the landing zone something could be considered a hazard um, we, they don't necessarily realize uh, that you know we have to make an approach to the pad and then we have to depart from the pad and if there are objects uh, within that uh, that uh, approach or departure um, uh, path, then that is that becomes a hazard. So uh, by by using this method of extending your arm and then rotating around, uh, you can identify objects that uh, might be a hazard to the helicopter. Um, and of course, you know I am speaking specifically to uh, the helicopter environment. Um, as you notice in this picture here, there is a pole that is above the level of my hand. So that would be considered a hazard, and so that is something that um, you would want them to convey to the flight crew when uh, the flight crew calls and, and requests a uh, scene uh, or an LZ description. Um, and so that is a really good way of, of helping identify additional hazards uh, and then uh, relaying that to the aircraft. Okay, here we go. We'll jump back into the uh, into the the broadcast. Um, the pre-flight involves um, the pilot going and doing a real thorough inspection of the aircraft, making sure that there's no mechanical problems or electrical problems with the aircraft, that everything seems to be in working order. I won't get much more into that because that's, that's the aviation side. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about 
the medical side. Okay, pre-flighting uh, pre a helicopter from a medical standpoint um, involves beginning of each shift, doing a very thorough inspection of all of the equipment on the aircraft, and uh, just like you would on an ambulance, um, if if that's where you coming, if that's where your background is. Beginning of your shift, you do a, a thorough inspection of the the um, the aircraft yourself, uh, the 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 components of the aircraft that you would be working with, the uh, the stretcher, how it loads, how it uh, how it offloads, um, your cardiac monitor, your ventilator, your IV pumps, your fluid warmers, your trauma bags, your if you're using video you know, video laryngoscopy, you'd be checking the batteries on the video scope, make sure that the batteries are good. You're gonna do a very thorough uh, inspection of all of your equipment and make sure that everything is is present. Uh, you have the adequate stock and uh, that it's in its correct place and that nothing's broken and everything is, is working appropriately. Make sure that the aircraft is, is clean um, or the, the ambulance if you're, you're doing ground transports, uh, that things are clean, wiped down, there's no residual um, mess left over from the previous uh, shift. Um, that has been missed in the you know the, the morning checks, or something has changed from from flight to flight. Okay? This is going to involve walking around and looking for things like uh, fluid that is draining on the ground, um, doors that are ajar, cables that have been or that are still attached to the aircraft, and that might include things like um, uh, grounding wire for refueling. Electrical cables for uh, like uh, extension cords for keeping your equipment charged. It could be um, uh, tie down, uh, rotor blade tie downs. It could be um, there are covers that go over air intakes. So anything like that that's attached to the aircraft that, that still needs to be uh, that needs to be removed from the aircraft before the flight. Okay. Another thing is wh when do you do when might you do a walk around? Well. You really want to do at least one person. Well, everybody should be doing a walk around um, when you before you leave base and and, and depart for uh, the scene, and then again when you depart the receiving hospital and head back towards base. So those are two times when all three uh, or everybody on the aircraft should be doing a complete walk around. Now, what about when you leave the scene and you depart for the receiving hospital? If you're doing an IFT, there should probably be at least two people uh, doing a walk around the pilot before you actually get back out to the aircraft and, and load the patient, and then one of the crew members, um, assuming that the patient is not um, uber sick and, and needs both crew members uh, to keep them alive uh, before you can leave. Um, if you're doing a scene flight, of course, the pilot's not going to be, uh, he's still going to be, he or she is, will, will still be in the aircraft. One crew member will be inside the aircraft as well with the patient, and and uh, assuming that you're um, not doing a, a hot load where the, where the engines are turning, the blades are turning, if you, you can do it, a 360 walk around uh, is the best decision. That's to, to make sure that all the doors are shut and everything is, is, in, uh, is ready to go. And there hasn't been any damage perhaps uh, sustained from landing on a scene. If you are doing a hot load, well, um, you know, you're not going to go back to, near the, the tail rotor. But um, you can at least look down the side, make sure everything looks good, come around on the other side, make sure everything looks good, and then get in, and uh, off you go. Okay? So uh, that's something, that's just a few things about doing uh, your pre-flight checks. Um, something else uh, that, I, that I did forget is uh, the uh, checking oxygen. You always, of course, you know, it sounds simple, but it is very easy to uh, overlook, and that is making sure that you have enough oxygen, uh, both portable tanks and... Um, and main tanks uh, on the aircraft. Okay, the next section is um, observing for hazards during flight. So during flight, you generally want to have your eyes outside of the aircraft. And, and um, 
there are three times when this is especially important. The first one is um, during takeoff. The second one is during landing. And then the third time is anytime the pilot in charge or the PIC says, I need you to have your eyes outside the aircraft. I need you to be looking outside. Why would, a, uh, why would the pilot uh, request the crew members to be looking outside? Well, there's an, any number of reasons why. But really, at that moment, the, the most important thing is getting off the ground safely. And so they may say, hey, I need one of you to, to look out and, and keep an eye on this tree off to the left or keep an eye on that pole of those wires and make sure that uh, I'm not drifting towards them. Okay, so those are just a couple examples of times when, um, when you might need to, you know, the pilot might ask you to be, to, uh, be looking outside. Um, and one other time is if you're flying into... Uh, like a really busy airspace, like around a busy airport where there's lots and lots of traffic, uh, that might be a, a, another time as well. But like I said, there's, there's tons of examples, there's many examples where the pilot might ask you to have your eyes out. Now generally, if you don't have a patient on board, you should be looking out anyways. You shouldn't be, um, you know, you shouldn't be toying, you know, messing with your paperwork or doing whatever. You should be looking outside and making sure that, that uh, everything is safe. All right, so, so what are you looking for? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, some of the biggest things are um, like hazards on the ground and other aircraft. But um, there are anything that, you might, uh, that might be a hazard to the helicopter, like hot air balloons. You know, there's a lot of hot air balloons where I fly. Um, birds. I mean, birds are a potentially disastrous encounter. You might not think, uh, oh, a little bird, no big deal, but... of maneuver and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, other things to keep an, keep an eye out um, are things like changing weather conditions. Uh, if you're in an area where weather changes very quickly, uh, you definitely want to be keeping an eye out for, for things like that. Lightning. We stay far away from lightning and thunderstorms. Microbursts um, can be devastating to an aircraft. Um, let me explain to you what a microburst is. Uh, if you're not familiar, um, I encourage you to go online and uh, do a quick search. Um, but it's interesting, um, you may or may not see the, the, the microburst directly. A microburst uh, is always associated with a, a thunderstorm, and we'll call this the thunderstorm. And what a microburst is, is it is, is just that, it is a, is a small, isolated burst of downflowing air. And um, you know, if, this, if this is the ground, what you get is this, this uh, extremely fast downflow of air, uh, an air column um, from within inside a storm. And this air um, travels down, it hits the ground, and then it spreads out. And it spreads out at very, very rapid speeds. Um, these can be wet 
Uh, they can be a wet microburst or they can be dry. Um, if it's a wet microburst, you'll have you'll see the you'll see the rain, and what you'll see is a is a rapid column of air that's coming uh, uh, rain and uh, rain and air coming down out of the the cloud and hitting the ground and spreading out. And I, I I think I have a picture of that for you. If it's a dry microburst, you won't see this column of air at all. What you will see is as that wind hits that as that air hits the ground, it will kick up dust and if you're in a, a dusty area you might see these dust plumes generally a microburst will last less than a minute um, so they're very isolated and they're very short but here's what makes them so dangerous this down flowing air uh, can travel down in excess of 4,000 feet per minute 4,000 feet per minute well, a helicopter generally will climb less than 500 feet per minute. I think some of the maximum rate of ascent of a helicopter is 1,000 to 2,000 feet per minute. Well, what happens if you're climbing at 2,000 feet per minute and, you know, 2K, and you fly into this wind that is coming down at 4K? What do you think is going to happen? it's going to push you down into the ground. And so that's why these are so devastating. And generally, pilots will stay away from, from microbursts in general. But um, this is something that you want to be looking out for. And if you see it, you can tell your pilot, hey, I think I see a microburst over here near this thunderstorm. You probably want to stay, stay away from that. Um, and they will do just that. Snow is another changing weather condition. You often, where I fly, we will often get fronts that move through. There's snow in them. It's not a problem to fly in snow, but um, it can cause a sudden and rapid decrease in your visibility, and you'd find yourself in an inadvertent IMC condition, and that's not, not a safe situation to be in. Um, other things to be looking out for. Towers, power lines, um, Etc. Anything that would be uh, could be a hazard. Our bridge potentially. Um, you might say, "Well, a helicopter, you know, you're way up in the air. A tower's not going to be that tall. A bridge isn't going to be that tall." Well, there are some t bridges and there are some towers that are that tall. Um, where I used to uh, fly, we had a tower that was directly in our flight path from our primary hospital to my base that sat up over 2,500 feet above the ground. Well, we generally fly about, um, I'm sorry, it was about 2,500 feet above sea level, but we generally flew at about 1,500 to 2,000 feet above sea level. So, you know, it, we had to know where that tower was to avoid it because it was tall enough where it, it, it could take us out. Um, so those are all the things that, that kind of involve safety, uh, safety of flight. Okay. Next Next topic in this category is uh, utilizing proper safety equipment while in flight. Some of the proper safety equipment involves things like uh, seat belts. Um, most helicopters have uh, three or four point, uh, three or five point um, harnesses. Um, you want to try and stay in your seat, buckled in as much as possible, and and that is for a number of reasons. If there's a sudden uh, mechanical problem uh, with the aircraft, you you don't want to be thrown around. If you got into um, turbulent air, again, you, you want to be buckled in so you're safe. If the pilot had to make a sudden invasive maneuver for one reason or another, unexpected tower, bird, another aircraft, whatever, you want to be buckled so that you're safe. Um, that being said, there are times when you, need, you, you might be out of your seat, and that's okay. Uh, what we want to do is we just want to let the pilot know, hey, I'm out of my seat for a few minutes, and then let them know when, the, when you're back in your seat. And um, that way, yeah, they, they, they can just kind of be more comfortable with the situation. Um, we always wear helmets uh, in the rotor wing um, uh, fleet, if you will. Um, I, I do not know of any fixed wing services that have their crews wear helmets, but I don't know of any helicopter services that don't wear helmets. And uh, that's, you know, just generally it's, it's good, um, good uh, practice. Keep your, you know, keep you protected, and then most of uh, most of the time, helmets also have built-in hearing protection. 
Um, face, face shields is something that you want to keep down when you are uh, in the aircraft, especially if you are working in, uh, in, a, in a type of aircraft like, a, like an A-Star where the compartment at the back, uh, the crew members at the back face forward and there's no separation between the, the patient compartment and the, the front windshield. And, and that, that has to do mostly with um, taking objects that might come through that front windshield like a bird. Uh, other aircraft like uh, EC-135s, 145s, um, 429s, those are generally the patient compartment is separated by uh, either a wall or a curtain or of some sort um, from the, the front of the aircraft. And in that case, it's a, a little, it's less important to have to you know, to have your face shield down because um, if something even if something did come through, you're not like you know and not as likely to to get debris or anything in your eye. Uh, but if you are sitting uh, you know left seat in the front. Um, definitely have your have your visor down just to kind of protect your face and protect your eyes a little bit more in case something were to come through the, the front windshield. Uh, hearing protection is really important. Most of the time hearing protection is built into your helmets. Uh, there are some additional um, hearing prote you know, additional uh, ways to protect your hearing uh, with earplugs. Uh, there are active noise reduction systems that help protect your hearing. Um, keep in mind that most aircraft, um, the, the cabin... Um, uh, decibels is somewhere between 90 and 110 decibels inside the cabin and anything over 80 uh, is is poten can potentially cause hearing damage. Um, sterile cockpit is, uh, oh I'm sorry, before we move on to sterile cockpit, um, flame resistant flight suits. The flight suits that we have are made of Nomex. They generally don't burn, they will char. They're only good for what we, what we call flash protection. So if there was a, a flash fire in uh, the cabin uh, you won't get burned, but a, any sustained flame, they're not going to, um, they're not going to protect you from that. Okay, sterile cockpit um, and critical phases of flight is kind of a, the next topic that I want to talk about. Um, a sterile cockpit is a, uh, a terminology that is used um, uh, to say, hey, we're, we're not going to talk about uh, non-essential uh, items during this phase of flight. We're only going to talk about things that pertain to getting us from you know this phase of flight to the next safely. And there are typically three times when uh, sterile cockpit is absolutely imposed. Um, during takeoffs, during landings, and during uh, times when you're changing altitude or changing direction. And, and the best way to remember this is not to try and remember those three, but just to remember that anytime you're not at straight and level flight, you should, be, you should have a sterile cockpit. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't talk. That means if you're sitting there and you see a warning light or you see a tower, or you see a, a tree or you see a bird, you announce those things. It's just things that make sure that everybody is safe. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I think the last thing we're going to talk about before we call it, uh, call it uh, a week is um, approaching and departing the aircraft and the safety zones around the aircraft. So, just as a general rule, I want you to um, to realize that this this, this what I'm about to say is is very specific to the aircraft. Um, it, depending on your aircraft, your safety zones are going to change. Okay, but this is just a, a general overview of safety zones around the aircraft. So know your aircraft and know know where the danger where the hazards are. Um, Generally speaking, when approaching the aircraft or departing the aircraft, first of all, you always want to make sure that the pilot sees you and knows that you're going to be moving around the aircraft. Okay, so a good way to do that is if you're, you either communicate with them through your headsets, then you unplug and depart the aircraft, or you, you get their attention, they give you a thumbs up, um, or if you are coming into the aircraft, you, uh, you would stop and you'd make sure that they, they see you and they'd give you a thumbs up to say, yeah, come on in, or they might flash the landing light um, if it's at night. So you always want to make sure that you've, you've made some kind of contact with the pilot uh, so that he knows you're going to be coming in, in or out of the aircraft. And the reason for that is the pilot can, you know, the stick or the collective, uh, I'm sorry, the cyclic, the, the pilot can tilt the rotor uh, blades away from you. So if you're walking in this way, he can tilt that away so you have a little bit more room underneath that spinning rotor blade. And of course, this all, this all um, relates to uh, when the aircraft is, is, uh, is running and the blades are turning, okay? So um, 
that's just kind of a general idea. You generally want to make sure, you, well, you always want to make sure that the pilot knows that you're coming in and out. And then the next um, part of that is, generally speaking, you always want to approach from the front of the aircraft. Now, I say front, um, and, and I, that's kind of loose, because what you don't want to do is, you don't want to, excuse me, you don't want to approach directly from the front, this way here. This is, this is a hazard zone. And the reason is, the blades in most helicopters will tilt forward a little bit, and um, this subjects you to being very close to the rotor blades. So, in general, the safe area to approach the aircraft is from about the, the 1 o'clock position uh, or the 11 o'clock position back to about the 3 or the 9. Okay, These areas here are generally the safe area uh, that you want to be walking when you are uh, approaching the aircraft. Beyond this, uh, beyond the 9 o'clock position, all hazard for a number of reasons. One, the pilot can't see you, and two, you got this spinning uh, tail rotor back here that will you know, that is extremely dangerous. So you want to stay entirely away from the tail rotor. Now I will say, here's a caveat to that. There are some aircraft where you load from the back. Okay, um, The AC-135, the Eurocopter-135, 145, the 429s, and I'm sure there are plenty more aircraft out there. They load from the back. And so in that case, there's generally a point um, behind the doors, which are you know towards the back of the, the patient cabin, um, that you, you don't want to pass. Um, you just want to go just far enough back to be able to load in, load the patient, and then um, as soon as you're done loading the patient, um, you, you leave the area and, and you get back into the safe zone. Um, so I talked about you know generally the three and nine o'clock forward, with the exception of the very front of the aircraft. Um, being uh, safe areas to to load. Um, okay, I think we're going to call it for the day. Uh, that was uh, that was about thirty five minutes. I want to thank you very much for participating. I sure hope that this was helpful. If you have questions, you can come on over to the website flightcrit.com. Um, at the top, there is uh, an about button, and you scroll down, and there's a, a contact me page. You can send me an email or you can send me a tweet. I'm on Twitter, at FlightCrit. I also broadcast on Periscope. a lot and have a great day.